Hi, I'm Matt Easton. For anybody out there who's interested in medieval weapons and, and certainly things like reenactment and living history and HEMA to a degree as well, and who's interested in replicas of artefacts from that period that relate to weapons, so things like daggers and um, crossbows and swords as well, as I'm holding, will probably know of someone called Todd. Um, and Todd of Todd Stuff, obviously website linked straight below, is a very well known and has been for many many years, in fact for as long as I've been in, in HEMA I think, so we're going back you know 15-20 years, um, he'll be able to tell you himself how long he's been doing this. He has been making very fine quality replicas, particularly he's most well known for knives and daggers and in recent times for crossbows. I should also mention that he has his own YouTube channel which I will link below here as well which has some interesting things with crossbows on. I actually have one of his crossbows uh, here as well sitting right down there behind the camera um, and I will be talking about that in future videos. In fact I've got a whole bunch of his stuff here. He has been very kind to pay me a visit and leave a bunch of stuff here for me to look at um, handle and to make videos about for my viewers here and isn't that kind of Todd um, and so and also kind of me for making the videos uh, so that you can I'm not just keeping it to myself but I'm sharing it with you guys out there so I fleetingly showed this sword in a couple of recent videos and it got a lot of attention big surprise um, it should be no surprise at all it is a pretty spectacular thing and not just the sword very often when you buy high-end swords um, you get only a sword but this is the whole set and it, I think that's an important thing to point out is that actually you know historically when you bought a sword especially a high-end sword it would come with a scabbard and probably um, perhaps even belts and, and the whole shebang it would come with the whole the whole set um, and the sword and the scabbard would in some cases the hilt and the scabbard would be made by the same um, cutler. Um, blades very often were made by other people by blade makers and then cutlers um, hilted them and, and made all the fixtures and fittings. Um, so what we have here is a sword that is entirely made by Todd. Uh, he made the blade and the hilt and the scabbard and um, the whole thing and uh, it, it is pretty impressive isn't it? Isn't it? What is it modelled on? Well first of all um, it's modelled on a specific sword, a bastard sword, should we say. So you might think that this is a long sword. The terms long sword, bastard sword are sort of interchangeable. I personally would really use the term bastard sword for this one particularly because it's not very long. It's um, Even as a one-handed sword it wouldn't be particularly long. Um, it's a relatively modestly sized sword. Um, and you could comfortably use it as a one-handed sword. So I would personally, and it hasn't got a particularly long hilt, so I'd personally call it a bastard sword more than I'd call it a long sword, but those terms are completely subjective. So um, it's modeled on a specific example that's in the Wallace Collection. Now the Wallace Collection is the premier collection of arms and armor um, in London, um, in one of the premier ones certainly in the UK and in Europe and the world. Um, and the curator of arms and armor is Dr. Tobias Catpole, who has featured in many of my previous videos and will feature in some of my future videos, I'm certain. Um, and this is a sword that uh, features in the Wallace Collection and attracts a fair amount of attention, for, certainly for as long as I've been going there, it's a particularly attractive sword, so people do look at it and go, hmm, that's a nice, it's just got that kind of sweet combination of breadth and, and size and hilt, simplicity versus complexity, it's a really nice balance. Now let's look at um, Todd's actual recreation of this. So. I'll give you a few stats as we go along. I'll just put this scabbard down carefully. I'll talk a bit about the scabbard individually in a minute. Right, so here is the sword. So in oak shots typology, the blade, let's look at the blade first, is a type 18. Okay, so type 18 blade is a blade that tapers from broad at the base to pointy, um, but the edges are bowed outwards, okay, which gives it slightly better cutting capacity than a blade that just tapers directly in a straight line to a point. So it's a combination cut and thrust, it's a compromise cut and, cut and thrust blade, but it is nevertheless tapered and very pointy. Um, it's very broad at the base. That's got various advantages I might talk about in a future, of, uh, future video. Um, it does of course add weight to the weapon, which is not an advantage generally, um, but what you get back for that are some advantages in, in the bind and um, in hand protection and um, in strength of the weapon and so on and so forth. Okay, the hilt is 
essentially a 16th century, first half of the 16th century style, um, and I'm actually not sure what the current dating of the sword in the Wallace collection is, but I would say, based on the appearance of this hilt, I would probably date this around 15, something like 1530, 1520, 1530, something like that, I would say. So it's a complex hilt, we would say, because it's not just a cross and a pommel. It has additional bars and branches, but it's not, a, it's not an enclosed hilt. It's not a basket hilt or anything like that. It is essentially a, a, a slightly complex hilt, okay? It's an early-ish early form of complex hilt. It has a side ring and it has a finger ring. I'll talk a bit more about the finger ring in a moment. And then it has this bar that you often find uh, on side swords and rapiers, which connects the end of the finger ring to the side of the cross guard here and forms essentially a second um, side ring on the side of the hilt. And obviously you hold it in this way, such that the large side ring protects the back of the hand and the smaller side ring protects your thumb, essentially. If incidentally you were doing German type things and putting the thumb on the inside flat of the blade, this of course provides a little bit of extra protection for that. And the nature of the ring allows you to do that. Now the finger ring, you're, one of the first things that people often notice about this sword and the original in the Wallace collection is the finger ring doesn't actually permit enough space for the finger to go into. This may indicate that the blade that's married with the hilt in the Wallace collection now wasn't always the blade that was with that hilt. It's possible that the hilt and the blade are a later match. They could be a contemporary period match, we just don't know. Um, we do find other swords which have finger rings where there isn't space to actually get the, the finger ring, uh, finger in, so to speak. Um, sometimes we find similar arrangements where there's actually a plate um, inset into the, the side ring there, which prevents you from sticking your finger up. We find that on certain types of sort of 17th century swords, um, hangers and certain types of rapier as well. So it's possible that just they, they wanted a finger ring on there because they just wanted one for the look of it or because they wanted to attach this bar up there and they weren't bothered about it actually being used as a finger ring. We just don't know. Um, but generally speaking, the blade and the hilt on the original example in the Wallace collection, they could have always been together or they may have been a period match-up or they may have been a slightly later match-up using original parts. We just don't know. Um, in terms of the grip, you'll see very clearly it's designed to uh, keep the dominant hand secure in one place. This is made for a right-hander, of course. A left-hander would have the bars on the other side. Um, and that swelling enables you to use the sword comfortably one-handed without the constant risk of your hand slipping down the grip in use. Um, you'll notice the second part for the for the second part of the hand, as it were, the second hand rather, and um, the second part of the grip is uh, not particularly long. You can just about fit a whole hand in there, but probably in use, most people would put their top two or three fingers around there and leave the pinky off the end of the pommel. In terms of the actual recreation. Um, Todd has done a lovely job on the blade. Um, it's hollow ground and that requires, generally speaking, more work, but of course it removes mass from the blade whilst keeping rigidity. Um, so it's essentially the centre of the blade. It's much like an I-beam or H-girder in a building. The centre of the blade is wider, um, so you have rigidity and stiffness in the blade, which is better for both cutting and for thrusting, uh, and indeed for binding and blade engagements. Um, but by having the hollow grind, you get a finer edge which is important for cutting, of course, and it makes the blade lighter and therefore quicker. Um, the hollow grind disappears towards the tip, which um, means that the tip is, to an extent, reinforced. Um, it's not a particularly thin or flimsy tip. This tip would stand up to quite a lot of abuse, and it's very sharp, so I'm being careful with it. Um, the blade's very nicely done. Obviously, everything's completely secure in the hilt, and it has been peened, as um, all original star swords should be, really, unless you've got an unscrewable pommel, like in Codex Wallerstein. Um, but it's been peened at the end there. Now, let's look at the actual hilt. So, hilts, in a way, you could say is what Todd's most famous for. I'll actually put the scabbard just back on the sword for a minute, because it makes it easier for me to hold without holding the blade so that I can actually show you the hilt. Right, there we go. So, if I try and move a bit closer, let's give you a close look at this hilt. So, there we go. You can see there's absolutely a ton load of decoration on there, and this this all closely matches the original. It's all file and chisel work. I don't know whether 
He's predominantly done filing on a little bit of chiseling, I don't know. Todd would be able to answer that. Maybe he'll answer in the comments underneath. And these sort of uh, ball sections I find very pleasing. You'd find them, you know, carrying on into swords, even into the 18th century, in fact. If you look at something like a five-ball spadroon, this is the kind of origin of it. They start out in the 16th century, they're retained on rapiers, and then they go on to spadroons and small swords, and they're retained right the way through onto even some sort of Napoleonic era um, sabres. Um, nice way of decorating the hilt. And this is almost like a rope effect going along here that follows around the D-guard around here. Um, beautifully done. The grip, as far as I can see, is not leather covered, it's cord bound and then coated with something, I think. But I didn't ask Todd about that. It looks like it's cord bound and waxed, would be my guess. Dyed and waxed. Um, but it actually gives a very nice grip. And as I noted in the other video, this grip is actually hexagonal. And I personally am a big fan of angular grips like that, hexagonal, octagonal, even rectangular. Um, even with things, you know, Bowie knives and uh, things like um, small swords, you often have uh, rectangular grips, spadroons, uh, although I'm not a lover of spadroons particularly, they often have rectangular grips. And I, I personally find that angular grips give far better control, not just of edge alignment, but also of controlling the bind as well, of feeling the opponent's blade. Oval grips are okay. Personally, I don't like round grips, but anyway, you've got really nice um, edge alignment and feel of the blade and the orientation of the blade with this type of grip. And then finally, the pommel. This deserves a close-up all of its own. Let's try and get that in focus. There we go. I mean, that pommel, seriously, that is pretty damn sexy. <laughs> I can't think of another word. To... It is really, really nice. Um, kind of rhythm, writhing pommel. This is a particularly, I would say, a German um, sort of feature. And I would also assert that this is probably a German hilt, although it'd be interesting to see if there's any experts out there. Maybe Dr. Dr. Capwell's watching, or maybe Todd himself. Um, maybe other people are watching this, someone like James Elmsley, or maybe Fabrice Cunha, um, people who know what they're talking about. Um, Maybe they'd have a different view of this, but to me, the features of this hilt suggest German, uh, to me, uh, German origin. And particularly this type of twisted pommel is a feature we see particularly on German longswords. The thing which, to me, would slightly go against a German origin for this sword is the proportions of it, in that it's a relatively small bastard sword, which tends to be a feature we find more in other countries rather than Germany. The Germans seem to have quite liked their long hilts and long blades. But, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, um, so, and it could be, like I say, if it's a marriage of different parts, it could be it's an Italian blade or a Spanish blade with a German hilt, we don't know. Um, and, um, yeah, so that, that writhing pommel is absolutely gorgeous uh, and somewhat similar to other examples that's surviving in other collections out there. Now, let's have a little look at this. Um, uh, I'll give you some stats actually. I'll give you some stats of the sword before I move on to the scabbard. So, let's. I've actually got a tape measure here as well, so um, I don't have to keep all the numbers in my head. So, first up, I weighed it before I started shooting this video, and it's not a light sword, it has to be said. Um, I haven't actually looked at the weight on the original in the Wars collection, but this one is 1700 grams, which is fairly heavy. It's about three and three quarter pounds. Um, it's not overly heavy. Um, but it's not a light sword at all. It's got quite a lot of authority in it. It is not a particularly light and fast sword. It is fairly weighty in one hand. In two hands it's absolutely fine, but it is relatively short uh, for a, for a two-handed longsword. Let's just have a look at the size. So, very carefully, let's see. It has a mere 31 and a half or 31 and a quarter inch blade, which is for the metric of you out there, 79 centimeters. So it's a relatively short blade, um, but pretty wide. It is two and a half inches or um, 6.5 centimeters. So it's a pretty whacking great wide blade. Um, the span of the cross is around about 9 inches or 22-23 centimetres. The length of the hull hilt from the cross guard to the... So I'll show you where I'm measuring from. From the cross guard to the end of the pommel is 8 and a half inches, uh, which is 22 centimetres or thereabouts. 
and the length of just the grip without measuring the guard or the pommel is six inches or 15 centimeters or thereabouts. So there we go, there's some sizes for you. In metric and imperial for once. Um, I'm moving with moving with the modern times, I really. And um, as I say, it's quite it's quite a beefy sword. It is not a light sword at all. Um, but beautifully made, and you know, I've got to say, so um, I don't know how long Todd's actually been doing sword blades. I know he's been doing dagger blades for quite a long time, but I don't. When I think of Todd, I think of him as primarily a hilt maker. Um, so, you know, the, no question, Todd is absolutely top of the game uh, for hilts. But it's really great to see him venturing into the world of blades as well. Um, and you know, I was talking to Todd when he brought this stuff over, and I think he's one of those people who just likes trying new things. He likes learning new skills all the time, which is great because of course it means we don't know what's going to come out of Todd in the future. He could make any kind of thing next, but for the moment he's starting to do swords, which is absolutely fantastic. And uh, what a nice job he's done. Um, and I know that he's got a, a collection of Albions himself, so he knows he knows what good swords are about. He knows all about the distal taper. He's friends with some of the best sword makers out there like Peter Johnson. Um, so yeah, interesting times to see Todd coming into, as I view it, coming into the sword making scene. And I know he, he may feel that he's been in the sword making scene for a while, but I think that by and large, he's not thought of as a sword maker. He's thought of as a dagger and a crossbow and then everything else maker. Um, and I'd love to see more swords out of Todd, so please, Todd, make some more swords. Um, but yeah, lovely job, well done, um, and uh, I will just give you a few more uh, close-ups of the sword before we have a quick look at the scabbard, so let's try and get it in focus. There we go. That's a nice thing. Ah, I nearly cut my hand there. <laughs> right, the scabbard. So, I think the easiest way to show the scabbard is actually with, with the sword in it. But just quickly, before I put the sword in, I want you to see how thin that wood core is to the scabbard. This is seriously, I mean, I've actually, I've made a couple of uh, wooden scabbards myself. And it's quite a lot of work. Um, uh, you know, and full respect to people who are making wooden core scabbards that thin and light. Um, I don't know what wood he's used, I imagine it's poplar because um, that's the one that's most popular for, for scabbards and it's fairly fairly strong, fairly light and fairly flexible. Right, so the, what, what do you say, I mean, you know, Todd absolutely knows his game when it comes to scabbards and scabbard fittings. Um, this is a pretty stunning scabbard as scabbards go. The tooling is nice. Um, you know, it's, it's, I would imagine that's done with a wooden, wooden uh, punch. That's how it's usually done when the uh, leather's moist, should we say. Um, stitched up the back. Bear in mind there's a wooden core inside here, so when you take the sword out, the scabbard, like medieval scabbard should be, should be stiff. Okay, Not like in movies where the leather flops around. There are scabbards that were like that, but in the medieval period they seem to have liked a wooden core on the inside of there. And the fittings, if we have a look at that, shape there is absolutely lovely and everything is if we look at the back so the back has got an interesting talking point so the back kind of to modern eyes might look a little bit messy but that's how they look that's how originals look it's braised so you can see the brass that's done here and I was talking to Todd about this and you know he likes to make artifacts that look like the originals um, they don't look they've come like they've come out of a modern factory but look like they've been made by a very skilled artisan in the 16th century in this case. Um, and it does, it looks exactly like what the originals look like. And something really important to note, which I should have mentioned earlier, notice the back of the cross guard is smooth and undecorated. Because of course, people aren't gonna see that when you're wearing it, they're gonna see that side of it. So they often, and this is true, true of the original I believe, they often just didn't bother doing very much decoration on the back side. You see this with rapiers as well. Um, and certainly true of the scabbard. So these features are brazed on and then you can see that they've been filed, that we've got punched decoration here, we've got filed cutouts here, we've got a punctured heart with a little dot punch decoration around there. Now if we go to the other end we've got essentially the same in uh, the other end of the weapon, um, just with a whole bunch of you know brazed on elements, raised bars that are then filed to give this kind of rope effect. Um, don't know how much that's in focus. And then this sort of almost acorn 
pagoda-like end uh, made out of looks like a solid piece of steel that's been brazed on the end there and filed absolutely absolutely lovely work look at that so there you go i know uh bling is not everyone's cup of tea but you have to remember as well that when you're making an original uh, when you're making a replica of an original it's about capturing the aesthetic of that historical period as well and i think something that a lot of makers get wrong is that they make a medieval replica but it doesn't have the feel it doesn't have the aesthetic um, sensitivity of original weapons and very often original weapons aren't perfectly symmetrical or they don't have perfectly straight lines they had a different aesthetic ideal in the 15th or 16th centuries than we do now and I personally if I want a replica of a 15th or 16th century sword I want it to capture that aesthetic feel of the original. I don't want it to look like something that's come out of a factory today. Um, and, you know, Todd, I think, manages to hit both uh, markers in that he gets that aesthetic feel of the period, but he also does something that's really precise and just really well made. It's not sloppy, it's, it's spot on, it's very skillful, but still has the aesthetic feel of the historical period. So there we go, what a lovely piece of work. A fairly beefy, fairly small, um, long sword, bastard sword should we say, um, but absolutely capturing the feel of the original and if you uh, did some fake aging on this and stuck it in a museum cabinet I don't think anyone would guess that it was a modern one. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.